transportation um, infrastructure here. We have things backed up locally, but we don't have any sort of digital preservation workflow. Um, and so we were looking for a system that would give us the opportunity to actually have some digital preservation and ensure these items would continue to exist, um, as well as providing um, a better access platform with better searchability. So that's sort of how we arrived at Preservica. Just a couple of more in-depth reasons why we went with Preservica as a system over some alternatives. Um, as far as moving away from Content DM, um, we were continuing to have inconsistencies with levels of support from Content DM and OCLC. Um, that only got worse during the pandemic because they were all working remotely. Um, and as we incre had increasing issues and we're working on more digital records while we were working remotely, um, we were having a lot of stop and go with being able to add digital content. Um, we currently have an instance of about 30,000 items. Um, it is added to daily. Um, our staff uploads thousands of items a year. So a day without being able to add items was impeding workflows. Um, we also needed to support digital preservation goals and access goals within one system that works best for our budget um, and for the level of um, digital knowledge we have on our staff. We're mostly a um, circulating library, not an archival repository. Um, so really myself and my boss are the only ones on staff with any sort of digital preservation knowledge. So this is kind of the perfect system for us. Um, and we also have a combination of born digital and digitized content within our collection that we would like to preserve and display. And we also wanted to improve the way in which we ingest digital content. For now, we mostly create PDFs from a variety of different digital resources. Um, and this way we may be able to ingest and provide access to them in their native format. Um, before jumping into the details of our project, I wanted to talk a little bit about the project planning process. This is the second migration I've been involved in. Um, the first migration I was involved in at my prior job was moving from um, Archivist Toolkit to Archive Space, um, which was a relatively simple process, um, but I learned some things during that um, that made me want to have more planning in place before I began this project. Um, and the book Demystifying Archival Projects by Margot Note proved pretty invaluable. It was given to me for free at an SAA conference, but you can get a digital copy for free online. Um, uh, there's a link there and I think the slides will be provided. If not, you can Google that name and it is the first thing that comes up. Um, but kind of through that process and just my own um, participating in projects, I decided definitely a Gantt chart was going to be important with specific deadlines and assigned duties to the three staff members involved in the project. Um, we needed to have a kickoff meeting where we could discuss what all the expectations were going to be, who was going to be assigned what, and um, what we were hoping to get out of the project. Um, we've also had scheduled check-in meetings. It's proved a little difficult with the pandemic because we've tried not to meet in person, even though we are all in the same building together. Um, we've been back here since June of 2020 where there was definitely no access to vaccines um, or anything like that. And so we um, were meeting in a large space for a small period of time masked the entire time. And so, um, we kept those as brief as possible and tried to just touch base on things that we could definitely not discuss over email. And as far as tracking tools for the project, we used um, Microsoft products, the Office Suite pretty much. And then personally, I used Trello to track my personal progress. Um, that's something I would used in prior positions. I enjoy it. I did not implement it on the entire project because I didn't, my staff and my um, supervisor don't use it in their personal work and I didn't feel the need to push a service on them that they weren't comfortable with or didn't want to use. Um, I've also relied on the Trello blog personally for organizing my own work. Um, so that's sort of some of the project planning that I did um, whenever we were getting started. Um, and here's just a timeline um, for what I initially thought we were going to do. So I thought um, we'd start off initializing the system, getting everything configured on the back end. A couple of months after that, we'd migrate data. Um, after we got the data migrated, because Content DM and Preservica were intended to exist for at least a year simultaneously while we piloted it as a potential access platform, we have to upload everything in both locations. Because of that, I needed to train my staff on how to simultaneously upload everything. And we needed to know exactly when we were starting <laughs> to do that. Um, so that we didn't have anything lost in the weeds. Um, 
So that was supposed to begin in this month, April 2021. And then I was going to configure the universal access, which is their public access portal for Preservica, and then begin user testing from June uh, 2021 to June 2022. Um, and that's primarily because that's our fiscal year. And so all of our contracts revolve around June. Um, so that's that's sort of why that date became important. Um, but as I got into it, I realized that in order to have um, the data be truly accessible um, and useful for people, it was important to configure universal access before I actually started migrating data from content DM. Um, the way that the different templates within the system relate to one another, you have to basically know exactly what kind of data um, you're going to want to show on universal access and how it will behave before you start importing things, because every time you make a change to those template files, you have to re-index your entire collection. And because of it being a robust digital preservation system, when you re-index an entire collection, the size of our collection at about 30,000 items at the moment would probably take multiple days. And that's just not feasible for any time we wanted to make a change to it. So we wanted to have that, that duck in a row, so to speak, before we migrated a whole bunch of data. So um, we've got the everything in light grays done. So we've gotten the system initialization done and the UA configured, and I'm in the migrate data step at the moment. Um, and we've kind of decided rather than migrating all of our data and then beginning simultaneous upload that we're gonna go collection by collection in the structure that we had within Content DM um, to allow the staff an opportunity to begin that simultaneous upload at a slower pace um, and get them used to doing that workflow before they're having to do it with every single thing they're adding to the system. Um, and that will also give us an opportunity to work out any bugs without having moved our entire collection. Um, so it's it's just a better workaround for, for everyone. And um, then after all that's done, we still plan to do the user testing from June 2021 through June of 2022, and then ultimately decide if we want to continue with Content DM or stick with just Preservica. Um, and this is just kind of a more intense breakdown of what that project plan looks like. So um, those milestones are sort of what those markers were on that timeline. Um, and we are here is basically where we are at at the moment. Um, and just a couple of things that I wanted to point out, um, the trainings from Preservica were not as robust as I was expecting. And so it took a long time after completing the trainings to actually do the steps that are associated with those trainings because it required a lot more work on my end to figure out how to do the stuff. Um, so because of that, milestone one and milestone two took a lot longer than I was expecting. Um, but we're still theoretically on time. So um, hopefully everything will go smoothly from here. And I understand the system a lot more than I did when I started. Um, it's just a lot more complex than anything I've ever worked in the back end of before. So um, that that has been, there's been a very large learning curve and that's kind of been an across the board thing I've heard from people who are administrating Preservica systems. Um, that it is very technically complex and difficult, and it's hard to understand from the provided trainings and documentation how these different pieces behave with one another. So just food for thought. Um, and then some assumptions that I made about the system. I figured metadata would be able to be ingested in a similar format to which we were bringing it into Content DM and fit more readily into our current workflows. Um, we currently bring tab delimited metadata into Content DM. You have to have a dot metadata file that is XML formatted when you're bringing metadata into Preservica. There's no way to bring tab delimited metadata into Preservica. We also thought potentially that state agencies would be able to deposit materials into a holding area in Preservica for us to apply metadata using tab delimited text files or another format. But you cannot retroactively apply metadata to something that you've already put into Preservica. And then we also thought that the metadata schemas would be easily customizable and flexible within Preservica, similar to how Content DM is configurable by collection. Um, two major things, you have to have one metadata schema for your entire Preservica instance, no matter how different, like your AV and your item, like your documents that have been digitized would have the exact same metadata schema. 
um, which typically, you know, those are going to be wildly different. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, you may have some records with a lot of empty metadata fields, like I'm going to show you with some AB soon. <laughs> and um, also, uh, the metadata file is um, a series of files that work together in the ingest process. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the technical details of that, but essentially, like, if you make a change to one, you have to make a change to all of them, and it is a pretty intensive process. Um, and you have to kind of have an understanding of how those things relate to one another whenever you make a change so that you don't break it, basically. <laughs> so, um, but sometimes you got to break something to figure out how it works, right? So that's that's sort of been my journey. Um, and some use case specific issues for the state library. Um, our content is largely PDFs, and we build a lot of multi-part assets that mirror our periodical setup in our catalog, um, which are called compound objects within Content DM. And when you pull those items out of Content DM, they do not have their structure. They have a text file that references what that structure was. So all of those have to be rebuilt. Um, there's also uh, Dublin Core metadata that mimics MARC records from our catalog. So it's pretty robust Dublin Core and has a lot of repeated fields. And we previously used that tool that I mentioned at the beginning to create records within Content DM from OCLC records, which created some data loss in the export because of how that tool communicated with the catalog. Um, we've had to rebuild some records because of that. So given all those issues, um, there's a couple of larger Preservica issues. Um, within Preservica, you can only use qualified Dublin Core that's supported natively within the Preservica interface. So all of that intense Dublin Core I mentioned is not supported without creating a custom metadata file. All metadata is XML encoded, as I mentioned, the templates, the ingested metadata, et cetera. So that's um, something to keep in mind um, if you're thinking about the system and how it might fit into your workflows. And metadata out of content DM using XML tagging does not mirror the tagging native to Preservica. So you have to adjust those tags. And if you have custom um, metadata, it doesn't really communicate at all. And all of the documentation from Preservica about moving content from content DM to Preservica is limited and only references specific migrations that will not work for expanded Dublin Core. They only work for qualified Dublin Core in an XML format. Um, so the solutions, um, we created custom metadata templates that include all of the D Dublin Core metadata from Content DM. We export metadata from Content DM as tab delimited text files. We save that as a comma separated values file. And then we use a tool that was created by someone from Preservica to convert it to individual XML dot metadata files. And those get attached to the objects. And then we reconstruct multi-part assets from Content DM um, in folder structures, and that's what gets re-imported into Preservica. So it's a lot of work on our end to kind of reconstruct um, the what we were already seeing in Content DM. And then we use Preservica's native import tool put to batch ingest data by um, the prior Content DM collection groupings, as I mentioned in the um, timeline. So I just wanted to show you sort of what I was talking about with that metadata so you can see that we've got a lot of empty fields here because everything that applies to all of our other material is going to show up here. I'm hopeful that I will uh, gain some technical knowledge that will allow me to suppress empty <laughs> metadata fields because this metadata record is much shorter than what is being displayed here. Um, but in the meantime, it does appear like we have a lot of empty fields. Um, and you know, for documents where something like the scan real number isn't relevant, I have no way to adjust the metadata schema. So basically it just has to appear as an empty field for now. Um, and I can kind of show you how that looks on the back end too. Um, so basically within the Preservica system, this is kind of what you see. So there's a lot of empty fields here that I would prefer just not be there, but I don't have that option um, because of the way that the metadata is set up. And you can also see here that rather than having Dublin Core in the namespace for those Dublin Core terms, um, I've created my own namespace um, and created a generic metadata template. And potentially that could be problematic later on because if at some point Preservica becomes OAI compliant and we wanted to harvest any of this metadata, it will not be tagged as Dublin Core. It will be tagged with these generic metadata fields and it may have to be remapped or something along those lines down the road. So it's something that we've been thinking about and keeping in mind um, and has sort of been points to consider as we uh, discuss whether or not Preservica will be a good long-term choice for us. 
and then um, just some potential future work with the system. Um, we would like to begin to harvest materials that are currently saved as PDFs in their native formats for addition to Preservica. So we'll be piloting some of that as we um, start doing that dual upload after we get everything migrated. And then we'll be piloting the usability study for Preservica as an interface and, and make adjustments to universal access as indicated by our users as far as like filters and facets and that sort of thing. Um, if needed, as I mentioned, it's sort of labor intensive. And then we hope to move to Preservica as a primary access platform if deemed appropriate um, by summer of 2022. So that's everything I've got. Um, and next we'll move on to Melissa. Hello, I'm Melissa Gottwald. I'm the archivist for the Aviation Safety and Security Archives at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Going with the flow is great but sometimes you have to portage to make sure you're following the correct route. In this case, the right river is one in which context and usability are driving forces. One caveat as I start, revamping our digital library is a work in progress. And as so often happens, it is not quite as far along as I thought it would be by this point. But I know where we're headed and I'd like to tell you about this journey. A little background. The Aviation Safety and Security Archives, or ASAZA, was established in 2004 when Embry-Riddle was the recipient of a congressional award to establish an archive of aviation. The university already had a few collections that had been brought to campus by one of our professors, and these would serve as the core collections to build upon as we grew the archives. Among the outcomes listed in the application for the Congressional Award was the goal of making the archives available online. This meant that digitizing and developing our online presence was an aspect that staff felt pushed to move ahead on early in the history of ASAZA. Staff at that time looked at ASAZA and focused on the fact that ASAZA is a special collections repository. It contains published materials and gray literature in addition to manuscript collections. They described ASAZA as an unconventional archives project, and this informed their approach to choosing a dams and to structuring how we presented our material within that system. They wanted a system that, quote, blurred the line between a library system of access and an archival system of access, end quote. This primarily meant that the plan was to focus on the item more than on archival context. The system that was chosen was PTFS Archivalware, which has since undergone a name change and is now Novation. And one of the key reasons that archivalware was chosen was the ability to allow full text searching of our OCR documents. And then a few years went by and um, I came to the archives as uh, the sole archivist by that point. And as I started working with the digital library, I started identifying some issues with the existing structure. The default, default browse structure reflected that focus from the beginning on the item rather than on archival context. And while the browse did start with collection as the top level, it went to resource type as the next limiting factor, followed by subject. There were also a couple of tailored browse structures that were set up, including one for aircraft accident reports and one for specific models of aircraft. And these do work fairly well. For example, browsing the accident reports starts with the country that issued the report, then the state or region where the accident happened, which then gets you to the list of accident reports, which can be sorted by the different metadata fields, such as accident date. On the other hand, there are things like this, which are photographs from the Harry Robertson papers. What is not apparent is that these are part of an accident investigation case file. 
So not only are these photographs related to each other, they also may be related to other documents that are part of that same case file. There's a real lack of utility in the fact that context is missing. For example, this photograph is a horizontal stabilizer from a Piper PA-23. I would argue that this photo in and of itself is of limited use. Its real value lies in its role as part of a case file, and it is best interpreted in conjunction with the other photographs and documents that make up that case file. The existing structure places resource type before content, and you can see here a list of what those resource types are. While this structure is sometimes useful for me and possibly for some other users, uh, for example, when I'm just looking for a photograph to illustrate something and just want to browse through a whole bunch of photographs, on the whole, I believe that this is not the most useful approach for most of our users who are interested in the content. So this was a nagging issue that I wanted to do something about, but it was difficult to find the time to address it. Uh, that is until last year when COVID happened and we transitioned to primarily work from home. I was going into the archives about once a week. And work from home and my task list got reorganized and computer-based projects got bumped up ahead of projects that required hands-on work in the collections. So I finally had time to devote to focusing on the digital library, clarifying the issues and identifying solutions. I examined the existing browse structure as well as taking a good look at what metadata fields we were using and also what other fields we might want to add and start using. Overall, the goal was to consider what we ultimately needed in terms of structure and how to get there. In order to refocus on archival context, I will be restructuring the default browse to focus on the collection organization and adding in series and subseries as appropriate. We will retain uh, those tailored browse structures that we have for aircraft models um, and also for accident reports, though those will actually fit into the new um, primary browse structure as accident reports are a collection with the reporting country as a series and then region as a subseries. One concern is that we have a lot of work to do uh, particularly in going back and adding series and subseries information to the metadata records. So we are not going to take the existing digital library offline while we do this. Novation allows us to set up distinct modules or what they call libraries. So we will set up a new library with the browse structure that we want going forward. And um, we can keep that to staff only until it's ready to go. And we can then move, which is to say copy records into the new library and do the updating there behind the scenes. We will also be adjusting the default list of metadata fields that our public users see so that they will automatically see things like series and case file numbers to help frame the item in the context of the collection. This is not going to be the quickest process, but at least now we have a plan to put into play and I am looking forward to the end result. Thank you. And up next is Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Mont and I'm the Associate Director of the Sam Johnson Vietnam Archive at Texas Tech University. And I'm gonna talk about designing an online volunteer photo caption interface during the pandemic. So the origins of this project comes from our longstanding digitization project called the Virtual Vietnam Archive. Since 2001, we've been digitizing our collection, and as a result, we have well over 100,000 photographs digitized and online in this repository. 
Um, as we digitize images, our process is if there is a caption provided by the donor. So this is anything written on a slide or the back or front of a photo. Sometimes our um, donors will send us lists of captions that go along with the slides or the photographs. We type all this information into the database record as both searchable metadata and make it um, viewable by the public so they can see the description of the image. And then the digitizer will add in hidden keywords to give a additional access points. So for example, if the donor say names everybody in a photograph, but doesn't mention anything that's going along in the photograph, then the digitizer may put in like Jeep or tank or scout dog or something along those lines to describe what's going on in the background of the photo so that it'll show up in a search for those specific terms. And this has worked quite well for us, but we do have a large number of photographs with very minimal metadata or description. So um, we started having a lot of donors contacting us and saying, I see you have my photos online now. Can I go ahead and provide a description? And rather than have them send us large lists of typed description that we would then have to go in and type into the system, we created a donor caption interface um, so that they could do it directly into the system. And this worked really well, but because it's specific to collection, um, we didn't have very many people using it, maybe one to 10 a year. So it was a very low uh, turnover. And then COVID arrives and everybody sent home to do various data entry projects and computer projects just like everybody else. And while we have probably enough spelling errors and finding aid errors to fix for all time, um, you can kind of only do that work for so long before you kind of go crazy. So about a month in, we got access to Microsoft Teams, which allowed us to start meeting at staff meetings again. And it was either one or three months in, our reference archivist, Sean Montgomery, sent us a link to an article talking about the uptick of online volunteerism in crowdsource projects, photo tagging projects, and things like that. And we've been playing around with the idea of creating a crowdsource application for the virtual archive to add metadata anyways. So we thought, let's go ahead and do it. So we resurrected our longstanding database meeting. And this meeting um, is where, where we, any button and bow or whistle or tool that we want for the virtual archive, this is where we design it. Um, we began it way back in the day when we moved um, the virtual Vietnam archive from Quadrastar onto archive space. And so it was the perfect venue for doing this. And we um, planned the volunteer headquarters using three different things. So email, which is great for small discussions. For example, what DPI photos are we going to use that's large enough so that you can clearly see the image and identify things in it, but not so large that it bogs down the interface or a slow internet connection. It's also like we have a lot of written documents, um, how-to documents and things like that. So we would share those via email so that everybody could go in and proofread and whatnot and give their feedback. Um, we did a lot of Teams meetings, so um, our, during the Teams meeting, our head of IT, Michael Detail, would share his screen and he would show us what he was developing for the interface, and then we discussed the pros and cons, you know, hey, we, we want a drop down menu, we don't want this kind of menu or this or that, and um, do we want to have a login or not, all that kind of stuff. And so then he would take notes and then the next week come back and show us the new interface and everything that he'd been developing. <laughs> And then finally, we have our own test server. So when the interface got far enough along, he loaded it into the test server so the staff could go and test it. And then we kind of tested it, hit all the buttons and everything, got it kind of the way we wanted it. And that allowed us to create our written guide so we could have screenshots from the actual interface and things like that. We also have a video tutorial on how to do it. Um, and it allowed us to create all that. And the final step was to open it up to beta testing from some of our researchers and donors that we have long-term relationships with. And they went in, used the system, gave us some feedback, we updated everything. So um, we have a photo selection section, which has several different ways of getting photos. Um, so there's 100 random images. You can do it by collection. We have a lot of associations like the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association or a unit association like the Americal Division Association. And they adopt us and encourage their members to donate to us, but they can also now start encouraging their members to go in and caption images from their own collections. Um, we have identification guides. We had these guides for our digitizers and we kind of beefed them up. 
So airplane identification guide, helicopter, art, artillery, famous people of Vietnam War, that kind of stuff. So let's say I wasn't a veteran and I'm not a Vietnam War expert, but I want to go in and do this. And I see a weird shaped helicopter that looks kind of like a V. Well, I can go to the helicopter guide, see a picture of a Chinook and be like, that's the one that's in my photo. And I can transfer all that identification information into my caption. Um, like I said, we have training materials. We have a written guide, a video guide, a tips sheet. Um, like this is how we want dates to go in because we have both military users and international users. We want the month and the day in a specific position um, so that we don't get them transposed. We we um, ask people not to type all in caps. We If you put in a, an acronym or an abbreviation to spell it out, that kind of stuff. And then we have an approval queue. So once um, a volunteer submits a caption, it goes into the queue and then a staff member looks at it. If the everything looks good, we can approve it. And then the um, caption goes into the metadata of the record as searchable keywords, as well as um, it's displayed to the public so they can read the caption. If um, there's a small error, like they don't capitalize Vietnam or they get the IE turned around, I do that kind of stuff all the time when I'm typing in, we can go in and fix it really quick ourselves without having to return it to the volunteer. But then if they start making um, the same thing over many records or they have an egregious mistake, like they type the record all in caps when we've asked them not to, uh, we can deny the record and return it to them and tell them why we denied it and ask them to fix the thing. We launched the project in September of last year, and we used several Facebook announcements. We also have a billboard on our homepage, which you can see the ad up at the top of the screen here. And then we sent out a targeted email to our audience, um, researchers and donors and things. For future plans, we're currently working on the document transcription interface. We have a lot of handwritten letters home that are not OCRable, but we also have a lot of military documents that are not high enough quality scans or the, the font is a little bit weird, even though it's typewritten and so it's not OCRable as well. And those would highly benefit from being transcribed by um, volunteers. So we're working on that interface um, to release soon. We would like to create a translation interface so that we have a lot of Vietnamese documents that can be translated to English and English documents that can be translated into Vietnamese. Our second largest regional user group is Vietnam. We have a lot of um, AV materials that would benefit from additional description, like our moving images um, that could use extra description as well as um, audio letters home. So a lot of soldiers, rather than writing a letter home, would record it on a cassette tape or a reel-to-reel -reel tape. And so a transcription of that um, would be beneficial. And then we're working on a special POW MIA tagging project. So we have certain materials in our collection that might help find the remains of the missing from both sides of the war. So for example, an after action report from the American side um, describing what happened in a battle. A lot of times they will describe where they buried the bodies and put a grid coordinate on there. And so if we could tag that record and put the grid coordinate in there, it could be flagged and put to the teams working from the um, government of Vietnam, and they can go to that location using the grid coordinate and exhume the bodies or the remains, I should say, and hopefully return them to their families. Um, same thing on our side, we have some collections that might have sightings of POWs or crash sites or grave sites that could be flagged and sent to our teams on our side so they could go and do some more research and hopefully find some remains. And we're hoping that this project will help provide some closure to the, closure to the families on both sides. All right, now I'm gonna go to the interface itself um, I'm already logged in, but as you can see right now, all we have is image captioning available. But here's where you can choose your um, image. So collection, association, random images. I'll go to the subject page here and you can choose from any of these subjects. But let's say I was a veteran who served in the Asha Valley. Um, I can go and look at all these photos and be like, oh, I know who these people are, or I know what LZ that is, or what airplane that is, or whatever. And I'm going to pick this photograph here. And as you can see, we do have a zoom feature. So if he had a, so a shoulder patch or if this was close enough that you could read the name on the fatigue so that you couldn't identify the person, you could do that. Um, if there is a caption already on the photo, it's written below the photo. So you have that information. And this button gives you a biography of the person who donated the photo, as well as the scope and content note of the 
collection that the photo came from. So you can get more background information about the photo. Over here, um, we've got the caption broken up into um, kind of the information we'd like to see. So if you're, again, you're not a veteran or you didn't serve there, you could just say, you know, hey, it's a line of sandbags and men are working on a um, rocket launcher or water launcher. I'm not sure which one that is, but, you know, you can just, just describe the scene. Or let's say you did serve there and you can say, you know, that's Ted Atchison holding his movie camera. That's um, Fred Miller. This is Ernie Walker and so on and so forth. And you can type their names down here in the person record. And then you can say this is LZ Sally. We have the date field, um, again, clearly delineating how we want the date to, dis um, to display. This um, graphic image, so if you click on this and submit it, what that does is um, we have a lot of images with like nudity, dead bodies, body parts, surgeries, amputations, burns, all kinds of stuff. And so what this does is it doesn't bar people from viewing the record, but when it shows up in a search result, um, it grays out the thumbnail. And so if you click on it, it'll give you a graphic material warning and then you click on it again and you can view the, the image. But also if say I'm a fifth grader doing research for my National History Day project, that grayed out will kind of tell me maybe I don't want to see what's behind there and it'll kind of shield people from things that they might not want to see. Or maybe a veteran with PTSD who doesn't want to see that kind of stuff. And then when we originally began digitizing, we did not delineate on the record whether or not the image was black and white in color. And we've kind of decided that that would be nice to be able to filter that in our search screen. So even if the volunteer does nothing more than click on a radio button and submit, that would be helpful to us. Um, under the resources, here we have, here's an example of our quick data entry guide with the screenshots kind of showing people how to use the interface. We have um, the tips thing that uh, like again you know how to spell things out and put it in the record and how we want the dates um, a link to the YouTube video if you want to watch the how-to video on how to do it it's about two and a half minutes long so you can go through and do that um, this is one of our identification guides so this is the airplane one um, so it gives you the name, the nickname, all of the, you know, these are the branches that used it, um, some very good clear photos of the um, our aircraft so that you can easily identify it. Uh, maybe for that last photo, we could go look at the armament and artillery one and decide whether or not that is a mortar launcher or a rocket launcher. And then since I'm a, an administrator, I can go over to the control panel and this is an image that's waiting to be approved. So here I can see the image itself. Um, I can see what they have submitted. And then here again, I have the option to approve, deny or edit the caption itself. And then we've created a statistics page here. So as you can see, we've had 130 people sign up to volunteer and 436 um, captions submitted. And then this is our leaderboard of who's done the most. And so we figured this will provide us with information for like a volunteer newsletter. Maybe when we hit 500 captions, we can put out a Facebook announcement. It'll help with continued engagement with the volunteers as well as um, hopefully to generate more business and get more volunteers coming in as we make Facebook announcements and things like that. All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I think that's everything we have. We did want to share our contact information one last time. And uh, there's our contact information again. Um, there were a few questions, mostly about the Vietnam Archive Project, but there was one for all of us um, before that one uh, that asked, how are we providing access to digital collections to researchers who have visual or other disabilities? Um, I'll let you guys answer first and then I can answer. Um, well, hopefully with our new interface, um, if we already have a caption that could um, be used by the readers for the images, and then hopefully some of this new information being provided by volunteers will help add um, some more of that alt text for the readers and things. I'm not sure how the documents, we load the OCR from documents in our collection into the back end of the record. So I'm not sure if that's accessible to readers or not. Um, 
I'd have to ask my IT guy to see onto that. But we are kind of thinking about how we can use our crowdsource interface to help make our records more accessible for ADA purposes and, and readers and all that kind of stuff. Um, in our records, uh, the text documents have the image of the document with the um, OCR text kind of behind that. So it is available to uh, screen readers. Unfortunately, um, and this is something on my list of things to address, is in earlier days, we were focused on the OCR as a tool for searching and not for accessibility. So uh, we used Abby Fine Reader to do the OCR and Fine Reader sometimes reads pages out of order and we weren't good about double checking to make sure that it was going to go through the page in order. So um, I've now changed that and we do pay attention now, but we do have a, a lot of legacy ones that, that may have issues with the order that the page is read. And then um, for our visual um, content like photographs uh, relies on the description and the metadata. Um, for us, we've been thinking more about accessibility. It's in our current strategic plan to make all of our content um, more accessible. We've done a couple of bigger system migrations to just better systems that are more up to date that work better with um, integrated accessibility features in browsers. Um, so we've got a new website. We've recently updated our ILS interface um, and we're hoping a move to Preservica will allow us to display things in more native formats like HTML and things that function better with some of those accessibility tools. Um, for now, we are kind of in a stopgap of making sure everything is in a PDF where the text is readable by a screen reader. Um, it sort of helps that the majority of our content is computer produced text. I think it's a little simpler to deal with. Um, we basically have no images in our collection. Um, and the video we have is small clips with no audio. So um, I can't really think of a way besides providing robust subject headings that we can make those things more accessible um, to our users. Um, So um, there's three questions in a row for Amy. So I'm just gonna read those off real quick. Um, someone wondered if your IT person used an existing interface program to build on top of archive space or if it was something that was just custom built. So our archive space instance is uh, pretty custom. Um, which was the same of what we did with Quadrastar when we were on there. We actually do all of our records at item level so that we can attach the PDF or the um, audio record or the image or anything like that and make everything word searchable. Um, so, and then we also have, um, they're not custom finding aids per se, but we use the container and box mode of the finding aid um, differently. And we have it so that you can read the finding aid and click on the folder and be taken to the digitized materials from the folder or you can be looking at an individual item and then go back to all the items within that folder, something if you wanna see it natively within its own interface. And the same thing with this um, crowdsource application, we built it in archive space. I think he uses programming languages and things like that, which I am not familiar with. I could get that information from Mike and, and, and do that, but um, he's a, he is not an archivist. He's actually a database software IT guy. So we've always had one of those on staff so that we could customize our interface the way we need it to. So, but it is built in archive space. When everything is submitted, it goes directly into the record. So no digesting it from like Flickr and then putting it into something else and having data errors or anything like that. It is all actually in archive space, but it is a, a custom interface. And um, do you ever have issues with the descriptions that people provide? And can you provide some examples of what those issues look like? So, so far we don't have any issues with that. Um, now we have had, so we have a longstanding um, process which has gotten us in hot water on occasion of we don't edit our records for any reason. Um, and, and 
if you think about the 60s and the language that's used at the time, sometimes it's not very PC. Um, but we don't add that information to the record. So if the donor provides a caption that's inaccurate, because like sometimes they just write the same thing on 50 photos in a row and it no longer has that P50 whatever tank on it and or it's misidentified because the guy was a doctor taking a picture and he thought it was the P50 tank and it really isn't. So then we will go through and correct it in some other way. Um, but we don't correct what the donor provides to us. Um, but the ones provided in the volunteer interface, we are going. So like if somebody puts racial slurs or curse words, or like we said, types all in caps, so it's not really legible, we are going to make these available to the public so they can be viewed. So we don't want to add that stuff to the records. Um, but so far we've not had any issues. The donors, I'm not sorry, not the donors, the um, volunteers have all for the most part been um, uh, parts of our patrons or veterans. They've been fairly accurate with identifying things and, um, and they haven't really added anything that we would be like, no, we don't want that in there. Um, but we do have that um, ability to go through and be like, oh no, he put a racial slur in because some of those gentlemen still talk that way to this day or they added in a curse word or something like that. And then, so that's why we have the edit ability. We can go in and remove that word. Um, and then if it happens often, we can counsel the volunteer or bar them from continuing to um, submitting things if they refuse to follow our guidelines. And then um, what do you do if volunteers provide conflicting information about an image? We are um, kind of going along the lines of um, allowing more than one volunteer to caption the same image. Um, so like most of us, we're all archivists and not necessarily experts in the subject. I mean, I know a lot about the Vietnam War now, but I, like I showed in the presentation, I don't know a lot about artillery. Um, so the guy that we have that's um, approving things, he's pretty good at identifying photos and knows a lot of the weapons and all that other kind of stuff. But we're taking people um, at their word for it. So if they do say, hey, that was Joe Smith, um, we're going to take, you know, take their word for it, but we are, are, are going to allow multiple volunteers to caption the same image. So maybe you do get a couple of conflicting things and they'll all be up for the um, uh, researcher who's reading it to be able to read and determine for themselves, you know, is it the P-50 tank or really the P-42 tank or something like that? Um, if, if it's um, really that important that they need to know exactly what model number that was or something like that. Plus we have our identification guides. Um, so those can be you know, viewed online and things like that. If somebody needs to go, no, that's not really a Chinook, it's actually a this or something like that. Because there's like five different models of Hueys used during the war as they continue to um, improve them and issue new models and things like that. So somebody might say it's the H1D, in reality it was the H1A, and it all depends on timelines and all that kind of stuff. So that's not per se my cup of tea, but um, we're hoping that if enough people identify it as the H1D, that that would be a fairly accurate um, identification. Um, and then um, I was asked how much time weekly I spend working on the content of the preservical migration. Um, whenever I first started implementing the system, I had to spend a lot of time to just figure out what my workflow was going to be. Um, but now that I've figured it out, um, I devote about 15 hours a week to migration. Um, but I haven't, I basically like wait on a batch of files from content DM and then I process those files. Um, and so it's kind of hard to say exactly how much time, but I usually budget, like I tell my staff, like, we're not going to play in this collection for two weeks and that's how long it's going to take me to migrate it. So I haven't had one take more than 30 hours of like actual work time, um, between like reorganizing the files and moving all the metadata and cleaning things up. Um, so, and that like, each of our collections, the biggest one I've migrated so far had um, 900 objects, um, but it had, I think 2,300 or something files in it. So that was relatively large. Um, our biggest one has 8,000 objects and I'm actually pretty nervous how long that's gonna take me, but um, I am doing it completely alone because the learning curve of the process was so big and it's not something my staff is going to have to do long-term and most of them don't have any sort of technical knowledge like this. Um, 
So to expect them to like learn it, to do it would take more time than me just doing it on my own, I think. So um, because of that, I don't really have any other hands in the migration pot, um, but I hope that answers your question. I probably was a little too wordy with that, but um, I think that's all the questions we have unless anyone has anything else they'd like to bring up. All right, well, um, I guess that's everything we have. Um, our contact information is on the slide. I can't tell if I'm actually putting this video in front of that or not, um, but th that's our information. If you need to reach out to any of us about these projects, you're totally welcome to do that. And we appreciate you guys coming today. Uh, have a good rest of your day.